Welcome to the Tech Money Podcast, where the worlds of technology and personal finance collide. Hosted by certified financial planner, speaker, blogger, and self-proclaimed personal finance nerd, Malcolm Etheridge. Each episode aims to make you just a little bit smarter about your money, all from the perspective of the tech professional. Without further delay, here's your host. Hey there, listeners. Malcolm here. And on today's show, we're talking about technology. More specifically, we're talking about the little known contributions of a small group of African Americans who've helped to shape what we now broadly refer to as Web 1.0. Through the years, a small handful of individuals have all taken credit for bringing us what we know as the modern internet. However, it is possible for more than one of those stories to be accurate, as the modern internet is the combination of several simultaneous discoveries made by a few pioneers all iterating on the same idea of a more connected world. In fact, it is impossible to crown one singular person or entity with the discovery, as the internet was the work of dozens of pioneering scientists, programmers, and engineers who each developed new features and technologies that eventually merged to become what we know today. But with all the credit and acclaim that has been paid to names like MIT's Licklider, the DOD's ARPANET, Vinton Cerf, Bob Kahn, Tim Berners-Lee, Al Gore, Steve Case, and on and on, little is known about the small group of African-American businessmen who made a sizable contribution to bring the internet to the masses. So that's what we'll be talking about today. I'm delighted to have the chance to interview Mr. Albert E. White to discuss his book, Race for the Net, which chronicles his former organization's role in popularizing the internet. Their early struggles to convince individuals and small businesses that the internet was a real thing to be taken seriously, as well as their eventual difficulties scaling to meet demand and the pivotal decision to sell the company. With 30 plus years of business and finance experience, Albert E. White has been an advisor to some of the most successful CEOs in the country. He has vast experience in the technology sector, including the Internet of Things, as well as healthcare, energy, and disaster services. Al's been the CEO of two energy companies and served as a senior manager for a number of technology companies, and he's been a successful in growing businesses in both domestic and international markets. So with that brief introduction, welcome Mr. Albert E. White to the Tech Money Podcast, sir. Hey, Malcolm. Thank you so much for that introduction. No, thank Uh, you, man. And under normal circumstances, I would ask you right here what other important aspects of your resume I should have included in my intro. But since we're going to get into your resume quite a bit throughout the episode, is there anything else you want to throw out there regarding the man, the husband, the father or the child of God or anything else? Okay. Recently this week, there was an article written in the Brooklyn Eagle, which was when I grew up in Brooklyn and the article features me as a high school basketball star. Hmm. In my early years, I was one of the top uh, high school basketball stars in Brooklyn, New York. Went on to the University of Denver to play basketball, and that's where I met Emmett McHenry, the CEO of um, Network Solutions. But the article points out that there were a number of famous um, individuals that graduated from Erasmus Hall High School, Mm -hmm. and that uh, they considered me to be in that group of uh, individuals who had shown a accomplishment in an industry that recognized a lot of technology and a lot of things happening. So I just want to mention that. I'm glad I asked. I did not know that about you, see? So there's a whole other uh, aspect to your your background that I I had no idea. And I, I did a good bit of research for this interview, this conversation, including reading your book that we're going to be discussing, but I, I, I didn't know that one. So I'm glad you, you thought to throw that in there. I did know Brooklyn born, Brooklyn bred though. I did know that part. Like that's, right. that's one that uh, comes up in a lot of places, but let's talk about your, your earlier career for a moment, right? You, you mentioned network solutions and we'll spend quite a bit of time there, but what were you doing before you joined network solutions? Before I joined network solutions, I was living in, um, in New York, and I had um, achieved recognition as a international banker with J.P. Morgan, with Deutsche Union Bank. I was uh, my final job with Deutsche Union Bank. I was the head of international finance for Deutsche Union Bank, which at the time was the fifth largest bank in the world. This followed my um, graduating from Columbia Business School with, uh, with an MBA in finance, and then I went to J.P. Morgan, worked there for five years, and went to Deutsche Union Bank. And then after 10 years in the international banking field, I decided I wanted to start uh, my own company. 
And I formed a company um, called AWI International, who's a consulting firm, and I provided advice to corporations and to individuals on trading overseas. With that, I also was a advisor to a, a pretty noted politician and businessman in New York, Percy Sutton, who um, was the owner of the largest network of um, radio stations in the United States, African-American radio stations in the United States. And that's when I first met Reggie Lewis. And Reginald and I worked for Percy together with Wally Ford, and we worked in trying to create a economic base uh, beyond the communication for African-Americans across the country. And then I continued just doing my normal consulting work for companies and advising companies. Uh, eventually, I won a contract with the federal government to where I created the international program for minority firms that was successful across the United States. It generated about $40 million worth of international opportunities. Uh, and, it, and it fit within my background since I had been head of international finance for Deutsche Union Bank. I, I moved from New York to D.C. and continued my work with the Commerce Department, but also continued my work uh, providing consulting assistance to companies in the international and the domestic area. And we went to a point where in my career, I just decided that um, I needed to find a full-time job. I think my wife was telling me I needed a full-time <laughs> job, so, you know. That it. consulting so, world can be a little uh, oh, yeah, un yeah, yeah, unstable. Yeah. Very, very much so. So I had been tracking Emmett McHenry, who had been one of my friends when I was at the University of Denver, and we had had some conversation about starting our own companies when we got out of the educational institutions and moved on in our lives. Emmett stayed in the insurance industry, but had informed me he and some partners had formed the company in 1979 called Network Solutions. A lot of people don't know that the original Network Solutions that exists today was originally an African-American company, sold about five or six times. So during this uh, time, while I'm in Washington, Emmett decides he wants to come to Washington and come to the Washington area and take over the CEO of uh, Network Solutions. They were just starting to grow when they, he thought they needed a somebody that had corporate experience, which was was correct. And it just went on from there that eventually Malcolm um, Emmett asked me if I would join the company and head up the marketing area, but as well as being an advisor to their CFO. Well, and hang on I, a second. I think we should, I think we should take a step back and actually set the scene for our listeners here for a moment. You, you you described NSI, I guess, in its its current form, but I guess we should take a step back and just start at the beginning, right? Because Network Solutions was a small minority-owned tech services firm located in the, the D.C. suburb of, what, Herndon, Virginia? Um, right, exactly. Who had just, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they won a contract with the National Science Foundation, which we'll talk about through the Clinton administration and uh, the different minority business contracting vehicles that you were alluding to before. So I just thought it was important to talk about where it was at the time versus specifically where people might know it as a publicly traded company today that was sold over five times, like you mentioned. So so when I got to Network Solutions, they were doing somewhere around 25 million in sale. And as I mentioned in the book, there was a lot of skepticism on bringing me on board because I had no real experience in the technology space. And Emmett was facing a lot of internal strife within the company about bringing his friend on to a technology company when he did not have technology experience. So well, that was one of the things I was going to ask you about. What about your background made them decide not only to bring you on, but that you were the guy to put in charge of firm wide communications? The rest of the firm didn't know my background, but Emmett knew my background from the banking side. And he knew Got the it. success I had had in helping companies and he had heard some things in the industry about me and my work within the political system in Washington. I was pretty close with the Congressional Black Caucus mm -hmm. and pretty close with some officials in other government entities. In fact, just before I took the position with Emmett, I was the African-American director for the Bush inaugural. And this mm -hmm. is like 1989. And As a uh, Democrat. I, as a Democrat. Right. As a Democrat. 
So, so, so Emmett felt that, Al, you got all these contacts down that you've, you know, garnered through your time um, helping with the inaugural. So why don't you come and work for me? And so I came into the company as an assistant to the CFO and it still was skepticism until about 10 months later when I closed the largest contract ever signed by AT&T with a minority firm, managing a $50 billion communications contract that the federal government gave to AT&T and Sprint for the communications network. After that, I had believers within the company and said, oh, Al can do something. And it seems like he's got a real strength in communicating and interacting with people. So why don't we make him head of communications? And um, so, and it's, it's interesting, Malcolm, because every place I work, people kind of look at communications as being my, my, my core. And I, I keep asking myself, hmm, I didn't think that was my strength, but that's <laughs> fine. So I stayed at Network Solutions and, and from there, the company flourished and until the time we got to the part about the internet and stuff. So let's jump forward there, though, because because we're, we're we're talking around it, and I appreciate you giving us the background leading up to this point. But as I as I mentioned briefly, so Network Solutions won a four million dollar contract from the Clinton administration via the National Science Foundation to be the company whose responsibility it was to issue web addresses, domain names to the public. So if I wanted to get on the internet. I had to come to you guys to get access to the internet, which is a huge deal, right? That's, it sounds probably like nothing today in 2022 and all you've got to do is go to like a GoDaddy or Squarespace or somebody like that, pay 25 bucks and boom, your, your, your domain name is, is live. But at a time when the internet was just now becoming a thing, we're talking about like 1990, 91, 92, that's a pretty big uh, deal for all of that demand to flow through one entity. And from your book, it sounds as if the partners at NSI didn't really realize the opportunity that they had at their noses at this point. They just knew it was a good bit of revenue coming in over the next, I don't know, five years, I think it was. But what really had just happened was Network Solutions won a five-year contract from the National Solutions Foundation, I mean, National Science Foundation, to promote the internet and all of its possibilities to the world at a time when people were just beginning to become curious about what they were calling the World Wide Web. Is that all right? Am I characterizing that properly? Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just fill in a couple of things. Sure. Um, first thing is, is that Network Solutions had had a history of developing addressing systems for the federal government. They had won a contract as a subcontractor developing a addressing system for the Department of Defense about three years before that. During that period of time, they had learned a lot about the whole addressing, the 32-bit addressing system and everything. When the contract for the global internet came out and they put the RFP out, there were requirements in that RFP, the, the request for um, information and request for proposals, that required that the company have prior experience in doing that. And Malcolm, there were no other bidders but us. We were the only bidder because we were the only ones that had global experience in setting up addresses for a, a system like this. So we won the contract. Now, prior to bidding the contract, the owners had met to decide if they wanted to spend what they call bid and proposal allocation money to go after the contract. And there was a split among the owners that some felt, well, we don't want to waste our money doing this. What is this technology going to help us do in the future. But the majority but majority of people decided, okay, let's go after it. Nobody else has done this before. We may luckily win this contract. But you're right. Nobody really knew deep down what the internet was going to be about in the future. I'm glad but, whoever was the majority ended up winning because you ultimately ended up with a, a no-compete um, opportunity for something this transformative. And historical. Historical. We were awarded a contract by the National Science Foundation to provide Internet addresses for the first time around the world. No one had done that before. And at that point, the Internet was called the Information Superhighway. Mm -hmm. And that was what we were promoting, that you could participate and ride on the Information Superhighway. And that's what Clinton and Gore saw as a potential 
economic boom for the United States, only due to some of the conversations they had been having with economists and with Wall Street, where Wall Street felt that the internet was going to be huge. I did not feel comfortable in the very beginning, to be perfectly honest with you, that it would be as large as it is today, but even as large sure. as they had predicted it to be. But uh, gradually, I started to become a believer in the technology. Even in the beginning, Bill Gates called the internet just a, a technology developed by DOD, and he saw no potential for the internet ever doing anything. But obviously, billion dollars, billions and billions of dollars later, since he's made money selling software in the internet, he, he's changed his mind. You've so, made me... Uh, um, You've made me think about two separate things as you were you were you were talking about that. This may be more of a question for Bill Clinton or somebody and not you. But why the National Science Foundation? Why not the FCC or even the DOD or somebody like that, like you just mentioned? Oh, OK, so in the early days of the Internet, the information superhighway, there were only two organizations that were tasked to develop the technology. Mm -hmm. Department of Defense. They were the ones that helped um, contract with the universities to develop the computer network that was used. And then the National Science Foundation, which had the relationship with educational institutions and labs. Mm -hmm. So it was decided that there needed to be a secure network for the Internet and there needed to be an unsecure network for universities and laboratories. I and see. the agency that had the best capability of doing that was the National Science Foundation. Okay. And the National Science Foundation provide, provided a, a link to universities and laboratories to use the Internet in the, in the late 80s. So for a, a period of time, besides DOD using it for their military arsenals and, and, and operations, universities and laboratories utilized the Internet through networks that uh, the National Science Foundation had created. The, the other thing that a lot of people don't know is that the Internet, when established, was established because the military DOD felt that we didn't have a communications network in case we had a nuclear war or a major, a major pandemic. And so that was why in 69 that the Internet was even considered. So it's interesting how with the pandemic, how the internet played such a critical role in communications throughout the world. So I, I wanted to mention ARPANET that so people would understand. To, right? Excuse me? That's ARPANET you're referring to? Yeah, well, ARPANET back then, and then the DDN, but the whole aspect of why the internet was created was created in case we had a disaster or a pandemic. Mm -hmm. okay. And that was so you know, 50 years ago. I'm glad that the, 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 the conversation was had however it was had, and we did get where we got, because you're absolutely right. 2020, there's no way we survive it the way we did without the Internet. And by the time the pandemic is already on your shores, it's too late to stand up some sort of Internet solution. Right. We saw just how many people were, were left out in the cold because they didn't have a stable Internet solution wherever they lived or or what have you, and we're, we're having to go to like McDonald's parking lots to get Wi-Fi access, right? So imagine if that was uh, the entire country uh, or the entire world having to uh, to figure out how to share information and, and such that way. Um, would have been a, a, a complete disaster beyond what it actually was. So that's a that's a very good point. Yeah, um, exactly. Something else I was thinking about is, as, as you were talking, when you mentioned that you didn't even necessarily, you know, see the Internet becoming what it's ultimately become. But as vice president of corporate communications, you were the one on the team who was actually tasked with convincing the various groups, you know, you thought would be most likely to adopt this new technology to give it a look. But you weren't really given any directives on how you should go about marketing this new technology, right? Because nobody actually knew how to use it just yet. So what did you do? So you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, once it was voted and we won the contract, very little assistance was given to me. I had an assistant named Mary Block, and she was in marketing with me, and we would sit down and start working through a strategy. So one of the strategies that um, we looked at was trying to provide people with general information of what the Internet could be in the future. And because there was such a wide gap between what reality was at the time and what we were telling people that the Internet would be, the believability was hard, very, very hard. And most people, the first question they ask first, you know, why do we need a new address? 
we have an address, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and so and in those days we talked more about the information superhighway. So questions came back from when I would give speeches at um, at government affairs or community groups. I, I gave most likely, you know, 25, 30 speeches all over the country that people would ask questions. Well, will I be able to take my, my children on the information superhighway? <laughs> How much will we, they have to pay? And I'm so glad. those are the types of things that would come up. And, and, and that shows you, you know, how naive people were at the time. And so one of the, the things that really kind of set a light off in my head was I did a presentation t- for IBM called Pathway to Growth. And IBM took it upon themselves to have discussions with their clients and customers about the coming of the Internet and what that would mean for them. And I sat there and listened to the gentleman that found at 1-800-Flowers, and he was talking about, well, you know, you're going to be able to order flowers from your home. And then I saw the number of businesses starting to get it. And I said, oh, no, this is going to take off because of this whole aspect of how you can use technology now to simplify the whole ordering process and the aspect of communications with other people. While this is going on, I want to mention this because a lot of people don't really understand how Bezos was able to capture this and become, uh, you know, one of the second richest men in the world. But Bezos, in the late 80s, started to understand what the potential of the Internet could be. And he saw it as a international marketplace where if he could control the platform, that he could control commerce in the future. And that's exactly what he did. But you still have to understand the technology. You did say that Wall Street understood the Internet and its potential better than most anybody else. Yeah, there were a few people. Some some of the investment banking houses had predicted back in um, 1994 that the Internet would be a $3 trillion industry. And considering he's a former Goldman Sachs partner, it does make sense that Jeff Bezos would be able to connect those dots. Exactly. And get the information. He, you know, he was receiving the information from some, you know, some pretty bright people on Wall Street. And when I when I was writing my PowerPoint presentations, I would utilize that information. And still, the believability was it was difficult in the early days. A lot of people just doubted a lot of things that the Internet promised, especially the whole aspect of and we look back at it now, it's just like buying goods and services from your home. No Mm -hmm. one most people I talked to thought that was the most ridiculous thing ever <laughs> because they, they, they lived around malls. They, th- yeah. That was their life, if you remember, going to malls. And one of, Malcolm, one of the examples I used to give, and I uh, jokingly, I said, in the future, if you have a, a loved one that passes away in your family, you don't have to go to the funeral home. You can go and order on the Internet their casket. And I, uh, jokingly, I say that, but reality is that most, a lot of the funerals today are televised over the internet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So family and friends can, can basically see the bodies. But that was the difficulty. So I gave speeches, did presentations, wrote articles. People would invite me to come. In 1995, I gave a speech to um, the Maryland, D.C. Uh, Minority Business Chamber, and I was telling them about the internet. And that was one of the things I was trying to promote. I wanted to see the African-American community really get some early focus on the internet and the opportunities that could exist there. So I was starting to become a believer that this was gonna be a major thing. And I thought that the African-American community really needed to know more about it. I think uh, to the point you were making before, the, the messaging around it is is what was critical to the adoption. So I'm glad that somebody along the way made the decision somewhere to stop calling it the information superhighway to your point with that level of communication, uh, confusion and call right. it the Internet instead. Because I actually remember as a kid, people on TV asking, like, where exactly is this information superhighway and how do I find it? Like the, right. the infamous clip that that they show on Super Bowl ads or whatever now with Katie Couric and, and Brian Gumble asking, like, what the heck is the Internet? And 
struggling with the at sign and all that kind of stuff. Like I, I have to imagine it wasn't all that easy to convince folks of all kinds that the internet was a thing worth, you know, taking seriously. But then especially in uh, minority communities, the African American community everywhere where the technology isn't necessarily as prevalent, but uh, let's, let's jump ahead a little bit, right? You're speaking of messaging, you're doing your job. Well, too well, you might even argue, right? Because you guys mm-hmm, started right. running into <laughs> cash flow problems once hundreds of people were coming to you each week asking for access to the information superhighway. And a big part of that problem was the inability to charge much of anything for that access. Why was that? Why couldn't you just charge 50 or or $100 or whatever, like Squarespace or GoDaddy or somebody else, like I mentioned before? They charge for domain registry today. Why couldn't you guys just charge a fee? There was a couple of... Um policy issues that strapped the National Science Foundation in expanding our contract. One of one of the um, things that was in the structure of the National Science Foundation, since it was a federal agency, is they were not supposed to have any sort of, of adoption of rules and regulations in the commercial sector. So even the fact that they gave us this contract was a political problem initially, but it was cleared up by the Defense Department and the Clinton administration that the National Science Foundation was the appropriate agency to do that. But with that, there were restrictions that the National Science Foundation adhered to as related to what more they could do for us. And once we won the contract, which was like a million dollars a year, they said, we really can't do any more for you. Because one, we're stepping out of our our guidelines as a federal agency, but more so, you really need to kind of figure out what this internet thing is going to be about and how it's going to be rolled out. No one knew at the time, the agencies didn't know at the time, what rolling out the internet would cost. And the cost for us was, we only have a million dollars for a global network that billions of people eventually would use. And we were asked to give out um, internet addresses to the world and not charge a fee. At that time, no one understood that a fee was necessary to to, to basically get an internet address. But well, yeah, um, you're 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 running a business assigning web addresses. You're not manufacturing a product or shipping out hard goods. Right, exactly. And and the other the other thing was is that everybody's saying, well, this should be for free. And mm-hmm. even the government mm-hmm. said that this is give them the addresses for free. So, yeah, we can do that. But who's going to cover the cost above the contract cost for doing that? So a couple of the things that, that happened to us immediately was you have to really have control over who you give certain addresses to. So in the beginning, we would give addresses to people who would come in and say, OK, I want the address from McDonald's. And we said, OK, here's the address from McDonald's. McDonald's would sue us and say, you cannot give out an internet address with our name since we own the trademark. So for the first few years, we got sued and the National Science Foundation said, that's your issue, not our issue. (laughs) So so you got to cover that. So we had to hire lawyers to defend us. In many cases, but we have worked it out later on because unless you had the trademark, you couldn't get, you know, a particular address. The other thing was that um, like today with uh, security, you know, cybersecurity and people breaking into networks that was going on then. And because a lot of people knew that we had this computer system that housed all the Internet addresses every day, somebody would be trying to break in wow. to okay. basically get into that particular computer. So we had to build a firewall, um, and back in those days, firewalls was very unusual, but we had to build one to prevent people from coming in and, and stealing the addresses or, or trying to come in and manipulate the, the software technology. So those are the types of costs. We had a million dollars, but our expenses were most likely in the early days close to two and a half million dollars a year. The third aspect of it that cost us is we had to keep a 24 by seven help desk. So if you're giving services to the world, you need to have the ability to have people call you anytime, any part of the world, and you need to speak their language. That was a cost. So those three areas were costing us 
for a system where we weren't being paid a fee, but just had this million dollar a year contract. And that's where the, the, the whole pricing and the whole structure fell, you know, just it fell apart. And we were, we were struggling just trying to stay alive because we had other federal contracts, nothing to do with the Internet, that was suffering because of that. And I, and I know, you know, one of the questions you ask about banking, we had exhausted our banking lines mm-hmm. on our other mm-hmm. business. So we weren't in a position to go and ask the banks to finance a technology that people still didn't believe in with a service that we weren't being paid for. That was well, let's spend some time there for a second. Let's 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 unpack that. Right. Because you just mentioned you guys had basically cash flow of a million dollars, a burn rate of two and a half million dollars. And this is the part that gets crazy to me because th- this is where I scratch my head and go, huh? Because anybody who's ever been involved in any kind of business before or if you've ever invested in a business before, the absolute best problem you can possibly have is more people who want the product you're selling than you have product to sell them. Right. And I understand in this case, you know, you guys have an ass- a- a- assigned an actual dollar figure to the web addresses that you're you're issuing. But if I just think about it, like the moment you walk into a bank and tell them, and obviously you're able to show documentation that substantiates this, right? They'll bend over backwards to to figure out a way to get you the capital you need to go forth and fulfill those orders. And so I think the part that I was missing initially when I, I was reading your book was the fact that uh, you guys burn rate was increasing at the same time you've got a fixed revenue figure attached to this this relationship. Am I? Am right. I understanding right now. Yeah, but normal contracts, what would happen is, is that your um, client would write you a check and say, OK, we understand now that you need more money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But because of this restriction of the National Science Foundation not to be in commercial business, it really it, it, it hindered him from trying to help us out. 30 okay. years later, down the road, it, it sounds crazy to me, right? Right, Knowing exactly. now what we know, right? I've, I've heard you say in the past that for about a two-year period, this small, relatively unknown technology services business basically controlled the internet, right? You guys right. owned access to the internet. If I wanted in, I had to come through you. And still, right. you weren't able to raise the capital you needed. Exactly. And... um as I said, in general federal contract, because I spent 30 years in federal contracting, if you have a contract with a federal agency, you would go into the agency, you would go into the bank and they would finance the payments of the contract. But you still have to be able to demonstrate that the contract is going to be able to generate a bottom line. Th- this particular contract, our history already showed that it wasn't generating a bottom line. We were taking a loss every year. Now, there was a discussion, and we did submit an application to charge a fee. We submitted that application, I would say, in year two, when we realized, oh, this is going nowhere, and they're going to, this is going to put us out of business. But the application languished in the National Science Foundation because I'm sure they were having internal discussions. Can we actually approve a commercial company charging a fee for Internet addresses? And um, it's sad to say the approval didn't take place until we had sold the company. Good old government and red tape. Got it. Right. I, I see. Right. But it, but it still is, is it blows my mind. Right. It's in your book. Right. On page 88, you guys have a copy of the contract issued to you from the National Science Foundation. I can see it right. with my own eyes. It's dated December 31, 1992. Right. So I'm from here. Right. Like I said, 30 years later. I can't understand why it was so hard to convince would be financiers that this deal was real. And one of the things that I, I think of, and, and I'll ask you this, uh, and I'm, I'm couching this and saying this is your opinion I am asking you here. But do you why do you think it was? Uh, let me make sure I, I phrase this the right way, because uh, I imagine in 1992, right, you mentioned Reginald Lewis as an example, right? Uh, right. I'm wondering why as a African-American owned business, you guys weren't at least able to go and convince, you know, a few prominent black business owners that this was an opportunity. Is that the same reason you weren't able to convince, you know, the banks that we're talking about that the opportunity was there and you just needed a little bit more runway? Or was there something else 
was there more to it that I'm I'm just not able to get because I'm thinking about it 30 years in the past? Right. I th- I think timing is uh, had a lot to do with it. If this had occurred now, I don't think we would have had any problem raising money. Okay. There would have been a lot more receptiveness to an African American company being involved in technology. But 1993, we didn't have as many technology companies out there promoting technology among corporations. And, you know, we were one of, you know, the few because of the federal government. But um, as I mentioned in the book, we went to um, Bob Johnson, I, I couldn't mention his name, but we went to Bob Johnson and other people asking if they would be interested in investing. And they basically, one, they didn't understand the technology, and two, they were trying to stay in their own space in the radio and cable industry and stuff. By that time, they were thinking about cable. But the internet was still unknown to them. And also, you know, a little jealousy, to be perfectly honest with you, Malcolm. And when Emma and I talk about this and revisit what happened, there was, um, we think there was some jealousy on the part of some of the minority firms on that we had the contract and they didn't have the contract. Also, just from the standpoint of them saying, well, okay, we'll finance you, but we want to take over the, you know, the company and stuff. Now, we did try to merge with another minority firm. There was a, a gentleman named Josh Smith who, I, um, who had a company called Maxima. And we went to Josh and talked to him about merging the two companies. But his situation had changed during negotiations and we weren't able to consummate a deal with him. As it relates to Wall Street, Wall Street took a look at what we had, but their whole problem was, you're not making any money. And we understand that this thing will eventually be profitable, but at this point, unless you know, you're willing to give us total control of the company, we're not interested in giving you money. And I think it was, they just wanted to see how far we would go to negotiate a deal with them and, and give them control of this kind of selective contract that nobody else in the world had. So I think was- one of the, I think as you're saying that, I think one of the cultural shifts that we'll come to appreciate later on down the road is that Jeff Bezos, I'm going to say single-handedly convinced Wall Street and the venture capital community that it's okay to take a loss for a 10 year period if it means profitability in the future. In the name of growth, it's okay to, to, to have a burn rate higher than your top line. And that, to your point, is what has made this a completely different environment to run a business in, especially a tech business that would be investors would look at you differently. But I'm also appreciative of you giving that additional context you just gave, because I didn't even think about Bob Johnson. And you're, you're talking about the, the billionaire founder of BET, who at the time, you know, was focused in media and ultimately made that shift to cable. I didn't even think about him on my list, but another good name to, to mention or Reginald Lewis, who you mentioned, owned a ton of radio stations among God knows what else. Right. At the time, the the textiles yeah, well, and package goods companies and everything else he was into mm-hmm. or, you know th- there was just a handful of people that i can think of in the early 90s who had significant resources who i thought would have been able to step in and and frankly make a killing here but then also uh help maintain control over this thing that you guys had stumbled upon but uh, fast forwarding just a little bit more th- there's the conversation with the folks at AT&T that you mentioned a little bit ago uh, wh- where one of you guys had a relationship with one of the higher ups at AT&T and thought to go meet uh with them to see if they'd be willing to invest in this opportunity with you how'd that conversation start so so uh, i initially mentioned that we had won a contract uh, with at t back in, um, I guess, in 2000, maybe before then. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get the dates straight now, but we had won this contract. No, it was 1990 when I came on. So it was like 91. We won a contract uh, as a, as a um, subcontract at at t for a $50 billion communications contract around the United States. And uh, the contract was basically given by GSA to at t to Sprint, and they put out a bid for a minority firm to come in and uh, partner with them. And we won that contract, and that became 
very critical for AT&T's winning other business in the federal government. So we had this close relationship. I had a close relationship with Clyde Jackson, who was the head of procurement, who was African-American head of procurement. And I had a close relationship with a number of the other people at at and So during the, the, the history of at and and Network Solutions, we would go to them and ask them for help in, when we had some issues that we needed them to provide financing or, or, or advice. So, so during the negotiations, when Emmett was negotiating and having discussions with his partner, I said to Emmett, well, why don't I go to at and and see if they'll give us, at that point, $5 million. So I went to at and and they said, yeah, we just set up this new venture capital company and you know, give us the book and let us look at the proposal. And they did some due diligence and looked at the proposal and said, we're interested, but our problem is, is that whatever money that we give you has to go into the company. Well, on that note, listeners, we're going to hit the pause button on this story right here. You'll have to tune in next week to hear the rest of my interview with uh, Mr. Albert E. White. But for now, Eric with an A, why don't you go ahead and close us out, sir? Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much. Uh, a couple of different things. Uh, Mr. White, you connected some dots for me that I didn't know were missing. <laughs> and you both gave me some serious flashbacks because when you were talking about AT&T and Malcolm, when you brought up the the interview on uh, on the news with what I think you said, Katie Kirk, um, it, it, about asking about the Internet, I remember the commercials from AT&T asking, you know, have you ever made a phone call and, and seen your child on the other end? You will. <laughs> and who, what company is going to bring it to you? AT&T. And that was back in 1993. So you just connected a whole lot of dots for who, you know, who was kind of looking at the future. Uh, and when you were discussing how hard it was for people to conceptualize what the Internet would be like ordering flowers from your house, uh, you know, those were commercials that really resonated with me as a geek back then. So I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, of course, Malcolm, thank you so much for bringing him on the show. And I cannot wait for part two. And I hope you can't either. Listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Tech Money Podcast with Malcolm Etheridge. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Malcolm comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. We humbly ask that you share these podcasts and leave a review as this will help others find the show. You can connect with Malcolm on social at Malcolm on Money. We'd love to hear from you and any questions you have, and we'd love to answer those. And you can do so by emailing them to podcast at tech-money.com. Thanks again for listening today. For everyone at Tech Money, our hope is that this show helped make you a little smarter about your money. This has been the Tech Money Podcast. For more information on today's topic, to review the show notes, or to catch up on past episodes, be sure to check out malcolmetheridge.com slash podcast. And if you have an idea for a show topic that you'd like us to cover, or you want to send us feedback, the web address again is malcolmetheridge.com. You can also find Malcolm across all social media platforms at Malcolm on Money. This episode was written and created by Malcolm Etheridge, with the production, the editing and sound controls powered by Proudmouth. This has been a Malcolm on Money original. Thank you for listening. The information shared in this recording and by its guests represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not represent the views or opinions of the host. This content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. This content is not, nor is it intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. It is always recommended that you seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your personal financial situation.